it's, it's really a pleasure to me to be here. I did my PhD here in, in Bi Biological Loyana Station, and I have been now outside Spain for more than 10 years. So it's for me it's really like a quite emotive to, to see friends or friends here. Um, so today, I don't know if we have to turn off the light. It's okay? You, what do you think? Maybe we are still in, in the testing phase. Uh, maybe, maybe because the, I'm gonna mostly illustrate everything using networks. See? Yes, perfect. Thank you, Lloyd. <laughs> so um, today I'm gonna introduce you and discuss briefly the idea of uh, interdependent networks. Um, most of the things I'm gonna introduce are still quite conceptual and quite risky, so almost no analysis. Uh, but I think you can give me feedback, stop me anytime, you know, criticize. And <clears throat> I think uh, most of us as scientists, where you kind of uh, move through different stages, discuss with different people, with dif different jargons, mindsets, and theories, backgrounds, and it's quite a, a complex thing. And, and, and so this is essentially what I, I try to illustrate with this, with this plot. It's essentially the idea you discuss with people working in, in gene regulatory networks, and then uh, you discuss with people working with uh, mating networks, essentially people with sexual selection, you have nodes here, individuals, and mating interactions. You discuss with people working in, in meta populations, or meta communities, or biogeography. I think most of you, right, face kind of the same things. And then you discuss with people working in food webs, where here each uh, square is a species, a whole species. So you move from intra-organismal networks, like gene regulatory networks, right, or linkage maps, till uh, complex food webs, right, species-based, intra-individual based. And so we can say, let's keep in our comfort zones and we just think, we think, right, the specific fields, that's okay, I think, because nature is essentially really complex. Uh, but we also can take, can take risk, right, and move between, you know, disciplines and to the interface and then face uncertainty and you have to build groups, right, that understand different problems. And so essentially what I'm gonna communicate here is that most, most groups, most people have been thinking in a specific networks, right? Like developing theories, modeling, null models, data, a lot of data from different fields, but for a specific networks. Um, so a big challenge today is given the amount of data, right? We already have, and the data is gonna come, it's gonna be more and more. Uh, the point is how are we gonna merge different networks in the same framework, uh, because it's quite, uh, I think, uh, difficult to say that one network or scale dominates everything, like the hierarchy theory, right? We can say that one network allows us to understand the whole thing. Most people today accept that this is not the case. We have different, right, networks that maybe, uh, you know, uh, uh, face from one right transition to another, from bottom up to top down, and, and, and so we need, we need to understand the fluctuating dynamics, not only within, but between networks. This is the idea of interdependent networks, right? This is the idea um, I wanna show you here. You have A, B, C, D, right? Within disciplines, E, F, G, H, between disciplines. We need people to move, right, uh, from one specific field to the, tra to the, to the, to the transitions to understand really the, the interface of uh, different disciplines and to develop theory and to use data to merge data and to understand the, the dynamics of these networks. And we are in a, in, a, in a, let's say, you know, really, really preliminary stage in understanding these systems. And <clears throat> so this is essentially the idea of interdependent networks. And, and, and today, I, I, Instead of, you know, the, the problem with these things, I think most of you have been facing this, is you can get dispersed. You can, get, you can really say, wow, but how can I do this? I mean, this is pretty bold, right? I mean, it's, we know the complexity within each network is really, really high. So how can we move between networks and how can we develop approximations to understand, you know, the dynamics of these networks? And, and so, um, you can get dispersed, right, and not focus. Today I'm gonna try the opposite. I'm gonna try to focus a specific problem and see how can we really address uh, a specific problem 
in the context of, a, of a, I think, a theory that most of you have been discussing. It's coevolutionary theory, the geographic mosaic of, a, you know, the classical geographic mosaic, right? Theory of coevolution. So I'm going to try to put these kind of things in how we can build, right? Uh, uh, a next generation theory taking into account existing theory and extend the theory using this kind of, uh, of an interdependent network approach. So let me, let me discuss with you briefly the model system uh, I'm going to use as a metaphor, right? This is the cichlids, you know, the great uh, African lakes. This is the model system for adaptive radiations. Um, essentially, these guys, uh, you know, they are across the whole tropical area in, in, in Africa. And you see the phylogeny in, to your left. And, and, and so some of the cichlids, uh, some clades, they have radiated. So they, you know, they, you have a foundry effect in a lake. You have several uh, factors there, but this specific clade, they radiate. So you have endemic species, in situ speciation events. Some lakes contain 100 species, 300 species. In less than 25,000 years, even in Lake Victoria, around 15,000 years after a big mega drought, you have these fantastic radiations. So the point is here, oh, wow, this is in, these are really hot spots. Right? The point is, what are the mechanisms driving these hot spots in biodiversity formation? And so, but you also have lakes that don't, don't contain species. They essentially contain one, two species. They're quite simple systems. And the conditions to have radiations are quite similar in the places where you got radiations where you don't have radiations. The question is why? And, and so this is a still, you know, a hot spot of research for several people. Um, essentially, <clears throat> um, we can illustrate this in, in these you know, four cartoons. The, the, the point here, the A uh, plot, shows a classical view of uh, like a Victoria cyclic radiation. This is like a, a rapidly diversifying food web around 15,000 years old and it started with a few clades, you know, after a mega drought, a few clades, they join the genomes and essentially in these uh, 15,000 years, <coughs> sorry, they have produced like 60 cichlid species. It's incredible. And in B, you see um, in some lakes you don't have radiation, just one, two species. Quite simple systems, quite simple food webs. In other lakes, you have, like you see here, you have really uh, um, complex food webs. And there are several groups that have been trying to understand the, 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 you know, the diversification of these food webs uh, using uh, you know, several metrics to characterize patterns of food webs and also you know, population genomics uh, models to understand the diversification from the genetic point of view. What I'm going to illustrate you today is that the D, the D plot here is where we are going to be moving. We are indeed already uh, moving towards not only understanding food webs, like antagonistic interactions, competitive interactions, mutualistic interactions, but also mating, mating networks, like sexual selection effects. And, and so I think most of you can say, yes, this is quite trivial. We know sexual selection can be, a, you know, uh, uh, containing set of mechanisms that can produce reproductive isolation and speciation, but we also know that interspecific uh, interactions also can produce isolation, reproductive isolation and speciation. We don't have a theory that joins these two forces. This is the idea I want to illustrate with uh, interdependent networks. We have mating networks within a species and we have food webs or ecological networks between a species. And so using this, we can then ask broadly, can we join coevolutionary hotspots with the biogeography of diversification? Do we have a theory to understand uh, these kind of problems? So which are existing theories to accomplish such an integration? So do we extend them? And so I'm going to now illustrate the theory part. It's quite conceptual. There are uh, no models. By models, I mean mechanistic models to understand the origin uh, formation of hotspots. Um, but let me illustrate you with an example. So in A, we have mating systems. Here I illustrate them just by, you know, you have population graphs with different topologies, but you can also have other kind of traits, right? You have uh, parental care, right? Parental efforts, and you have also uh, sexually selected traits, so traits that change fitness of males and females. And, and you can have, a, you know, reciprocal, reciprocal preferences. And, and essentially, this is a whole field by itself. And, 
On the other side, we have ecological networks that I think some of you have been listening today, some in very interesting talks where you have essentially species, each cycle here is species, and then you have, you know, the energy flow can be antagonistic, predator prey, mutualistic, antagonistic, any kind of interaction you have in mind. So the tangled web here would be something merging the two approaches. It's something that, you know, is the idea of interdependent network. It's essentially, if we add all these elements within each species, so we had, we had to have uh, individual level details in, in ecological networks, how far we can go, right? So first we had to develop, at least conceptually, uh, you know, a framework, and then we can maybe implement it using different modeling strategies. And so this plot is a bit, you know, it's more in the transition between science and art, but what I wanna communicate here is uh, when you discuss with people doing um, um, Systems biology, they think in genotype, phenotype maps. Essentially, you have uh, the genotype, you have the phenotype, and then you have the population here. This is a multi-layer network. Essentially, these are individuals that are connected with other individuals, mating, you know, behavioral interactions, uh, wherever you think about the population at this level. But then here you have uh, the traits, right, the traits, can be sexual traits, can be trophic traits, any kind of trait you have in mind given your specific research. But I, I'm gonna focus here in two types of uh, uh, traits. Essentially, uh, sexual traits in red and, and trophic traits. This is to illustrate how can we merge interdependent networks, right, in the context of coevolutionary hotspots. So I wanna essentially say, okay, you have complex traits, they are, you know, several genes, interacting genes producing complex traits. And in this case here, you have uh, sexual traits and trophic traits, and they are essentially independent. This is what I wanna show you here, they are independent. Let's assume you have individuals during development, all these traits are essentially independent traits. It's, a, it's just an assumption. And, and the red lines here, this individual here, you know, all the decisions are essentially decision taking between sexual traits. The fitness of this individual is mostly driven by sexual and trophic traits. It's an assumption. Essentially, this is the uh, Fisherian, uh, Fisherian uh, runaway selection theory. It's, I mean, in population genetics, it's well known. You don't need interspecific interactions to produce the productive isolation. You can get a speciation just by having uh, <coughs> Uh, sexual selection. And uh, in, the other, in, your, in the right side, you have essentially the classical uh, geographic mosaic theory. Uh, so in addition to some mechanism of this theory that does, these are, you know, gene flow, genetic drift, a specific mosaic in space, these things are normally the backbone of the models. You add coevolutionary uh, interspecific uh, interactions. Essentially, the classical uh, host parasite where the parasite, you know, uh, forces the host to change the, the productive system and goes to a speciation, and then you have potentially co-speciation events between hosts and, and parasites. But I want to illustrate here that the trophic traits, they are, you know, you see the arrows there, they force the sexual traits. They, they, this is essentially the idea of asymmetry. So the individuals during development, they, you know, the, the most important traits, traits are changing fitness, are the traits that are mediated by uh, interspecific interactions. These are essentially the other theory, right? And, and, and we don't have, unfortunately, really, really good predictions to understand uh, uh, this kind of asymmetry, right? To understand coevolutionary diversification or hotspots. In the center is essentially the idea of integration, is when you have the, both kind of traits highly you know, correlated and the, you don't have more important traits, so, so the, they all are equally important. These are three scenarios, and for, of course, I want to illustrate here, it's quite complex. Most of these traits are quite complex. You have several paths, you have several genes, you have linkage, right? you have several underlying processes defining the, the correlation uh, matrices, defining these, uh, you know, multiple traits. Um, so, but, Essentially, we can put this in a three-dimensional phase space. Is the idea of asymmetry in, in, in how the traits are interacting, right? Because we, have, we can have highly correlated traits, but we also are interested in the, in the, in the directionality, in who, who, is, you know, who is having really the importance, right, to drive the dynamics. 
And I think, unless some of you say, well, we can do this in other ways, I'm sure we can. But you need a mechanistic understanding. You need to put in a model that there are specific traits, you know, governing the dynamics. And then you can relax that assumption and, or you can do the opposite. And this is essentially so in, shown in this, in this, in this uh, <coughs> gradient here. You have asymmetry, zero, is uh, essentially the scenario here, right? No asymmetry, highly integrated. Uh, and then you have a strong asymmetry when you go up and you have there in that corner the geographic mosaic. And when you go down here, you have the Fisherian sexual selection. Essentially, when you put a second dimension, you can have in this uh, uh, asymmetries independent of integration because you, have, you can have highly modular, like here, highly modular trade space, right? And like in this range, right? But at the same time, highly uh, asymmetric. These are like sexual traits dominating, right? The dynamics of the populations. And, and in, in, the, in the other extreme, you have interspecific interactions governing the dynamics. Right of the population dynamics, and here you have the strength of coevolutionary selection. Right, you can essentially in a model you can tune this. You can when this goes to zero, it's neutral dynamics. You have drift, but when you go up to zero, right, you you you, you increase the the, the the strength of coevolutionary interactions. Essentially, this is saying that males and females they have preferences, and this is changing the fitness of individuals reciprocally. This is reciprocal trade change between males and females within species and a reciprocal train change between uh, species. And so you can essentially, right, model these things. And here, you know, the orange on the top is essentially you increase the strength and then you increase the probability that you are reproducing these two theories and you have coevolutionary diversification driven by these two different phenomena. But of course, we have a big gap and the gap I want to mention, to, 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 to illustrate today is how to join these two, uh, these two extremes. So we don't have a theory exploring uh, uh, individuals, the genotype phenotype maps of populations, right? Explicitly in space. And then you have, you know, recombination, mutation, you have genetic drift, you tune up this, the strength of coevolutionary selection and you can explore diversification, speciation. We don't have a theory for this, but we need to explore not only the extremes, we need to explore a continuous, right? You need, we need to go from a, you know, from a peak to, a, you have to cross the valleys, you have to move through different values of integration and asymmetry and extreme of coevolutionary diversification. And we can do this using interdependent networks, essentially because we are joining uh, intra-specific, right, uh, dynamics with between specific dynamics. And so this is essentially the conceptual, uh, maybe for most of you, this is already out there. I'm just trying to synthesize and to formalize conceptually uh, these kind of problems. And I'm going to illustrate now you an example. Uh, this essentially, I'm yeah, jumping to you know to the to another stage, and uh, because we don't have this kind of models yet, but we have models where we can explore the the formation of hot spots without selection. Right? And assuming that all traits are completely independent. We have models for that. And, and essentially, <coughs> the idea I want to illustrate here is that, okay, um, this puzzle is, is quite a big, essentially, we can have coevolution and coevolutionary hot spots driven by biotic interactions. But we can also have uh, coevolutionary hot spots driven by abiotic forces or just by drift. By drift means here we don't need selection. We need, uh, you know, to understand well maybe that uh, populations moving in, in, in landscapes that change in space and time and populations diverge. And because essentially drift and the, the landscape dynamics, several species merge, they, you know, they uh, hybridize and they can produce an explosion of uh, uh, speciation events. This can be an hypothesis for an alternative or let's say a neutral model to understand coevolutionary diversification, right, of, uh, driven by biotic interactions. And essentially, the point I want to illustrate here is that we, we still don't have a framework to understand all these networks together, but, and, and we have, let's say, um, meta populations drifting in space, right, and, and, but we can also have mating, uh, you know, sexual selection and reproductive isolation, and we can also have interspecific interactions. So we, 
we need to understand the, the interaction between the different networks and for that we need models, right, assuming also neutrality, right, to really tune up and see how important selection is in driving hotspots. And so, for example, um, uh, we have models already where, let's say, <coughs> you have a strong asymmetry because individuals have traits, but essentially mating traits, no coevolution. Individuals are essentially mating with higher preference with the neighborhood, right? And so you have a spatially splicing landscape, are individuals, you know, they, they have a sort of mating, essentially. And this sort of mating is producing, uh, you know, with mutations and other uh, mechanisms, producing, you know, uh, divergence, and at some point you have a speciation events. It's the classical idea of allopatric speciation or parapatric speciation. And so we can explore a theory with a strong asymmetry, low integration, because it's highly modular, you know, traits, they are not in interacting, and then uh, almost nearly neutral se uh, uh, selection, almost no selection. And we can go far with this, we can go quite far, and uh, indeed, uh, these are, are already quite complex models. For example, you can use random geometric graphs, and, and you can explore, you can, here, uh, uh, red circles are like habitats, patches, and you can connect two patches, right, if they are close enough. You know, if they, you know, are beyond a, a threshold, then you, you disconnect them. And so you can move from completely isolated patches, this is the infinite island model, so, and you can move to other extremes, a fully connected graph, or a fully connected landscape. For people working in landscape ecology or, or meta populations, it's quite common. Uh, but what is not common is to use in each side, to implement in each side, you have a population, a mating. You have a population with explicit mating and with uh, preference mechanisms, and then you can explore also sympatric speciation within each uh, site. Uh, and so, these models are already out there, and, and there are several predictions, and complement models uh, with biotic interactions. Biotic, I mean the combination of uh, mating or sexual uh, selection with interspecific interactions. Um, with these uh, kind of models, for example, we can, let's say, uh, individuals arrive to a lake, it's a founder effect, and they are, let's say, relatives, so they have some um, uh, genetic variants in the initial stage, and then you put uh, uh, basic uh, population genetics processes, and, and then you start to have divergence, right? Some individuals start uh, to have divergence, it's driven by a sort of mating, um, and then you increase when you know generations move on, and then at some point you have isolated classes and a spe a species formation. And so you put these models in, in, in landscapes, in spatially explicit landscapes, and essentially in landscapes that change in time and space, like a continental drift. Um, so you can essentially ask yourself, can, are we able to produce hotspots without uh, selection? And, and so, for example, uh, we did this uh, for tropical red fish. And these guys were, you know, uh, millions, 40 million years ago, quite common. The, uh, sorry, uh, this is uh, here to your right, the empirical data, right? Where green is a hot spot. Right and red is a call spot, and in the in your left side is the the, the, the uh, in a, an output of a simulation using essentially the model I showed you with a, a with a small trick, and the trick is that there is no uh, drift, there is no population drift, there is continental drift what drives the dynamics. Essentially, you do a transformation, and, and the population dynamics is driven by land by by the continental drift. So these guys live in the surface. Uh, of the tropical areas, and, and, and so you put, you see the, the, the sites, and then you put as an input the continental drift. The, the data is already here. And so these are the slices, like with 100,000 years, thousand of slices, and then the landscape is change, changing, and then the individuals move where the, the sites are available. And they essentially are moving towards uh, the landscape where sites are available, some populations go to extinction, and then they colonize given by a threshold, as I, as I saw you with the random geometric graph before. And ya, just by that kind of a process, plus uh, uh, speciation, and essentially speciation here is you count the number of generations a population has been isolated in a patch. You can more or less count that because you follow, you track the, the model, and you can say when an speciation event occurs. 
and you track the speciation events. So you, you, you build the phylogeny, and at the same time, the species are moving in space because the availability, given the continental drift, is, 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 is changing continuously. And so the main point here is you see that the, these guys, these guys, they have been moving from the Mediterranean Sea, right, towards uh, the east, east side, and then they are moving towards south, and then they, they arrive to Australia, where several taxa reunified, and they have produced today a hot spot. And you can, you can really replicate this scenario without the need of uh, coevolutionary selection, as I was explaining before. The challenge here, I think, just to uh, wrap up, is that um, today, I think, the connection between ecological and reproductive interactions at small scales, but small scales, I mean, uh, this is taxa specific, but we need mechanisms at small scales, that is responsible for large scale associations between coevolutionary hotspots and diversification is not well understood. And for example, uh, um, this model, uh, modeling framework using uh, landscape dynamics, right, to understand hotspot formation, uh, landscape structure, the strength of a sort of mating, and, and the intensity and directionality, I think this is gone, but they don't know why. So the landscape structure, strength of a sort of mating, and intensity and directionality, of gene flow uh, may play a critical role to anticipate the formation of hot and cold spots. And however, I think the big challenge, one of the big challenges, is to merge the integration of functional traits and their asymmetry and the coevolutionary interactions within and between species to diversification models while keeping them testable is a big challenge uh, to infer small scale mechanisms predicting large scale biodiversity patterns. And um, yeah, thank you.